Section three of the Indian Story The Indian Story Book by Richard Wilson Story one Rama's Quest Parts five and six Part five Now one of the giants had left the field of battle and made his way to the court of Ravana, the king of giants, where he told of the fate which had befallen that monarch's army at the hands of the mighty Rama. As he spoke, the giantess also came to tell of the wrong she had suffered at the hands of Lakshmana, and the terrible Ravana swore to take the most dire vengeance upon the three wanderers, and that without loss of time. Now, when Ravana had come to this decision, he rested upon it for a while, and did not appear to be exceedingly eager to place himself in the way of the two brave brothers. But his sister, who had lost her nose, told him that the best possible way of revenging himself upon Rama was to carry off his beautiful and devoted wife. The king of the giants thereupon roused himself and began to think the matter out, and when he did begin with a plot, he was an adept at making it successful. He called to him a Rakrasa named Maricha, and by his magic power transformed him into a beautiful golden deer which had its sides spotted with silver and horns set with jewels. He then told the animal to present itself before Sita, who, when she saw it, was filled with wondering admiration, and begged Rama to go after it and capture it. Rama consented to do so, but stipulated that his brother was to remain in charge of Sita, and on no account to allow her to go out of his sight. After a short chase, he shot the deer in the breast, and with its last breath it called out in a plaintive voice, Ah, Sita, ah, Lakshmana, cleverly reproducing the tones of Rama himself. The words reached the ears of Sita, as they were intended to do, and she implored Lakshmana to go at once to the help of her lord. At first he refused, but when the princess began to reproach him with cowardice, he had no choice but to set out on the errand. Sita placed herself at the door of her cottage, to await the return of the brothers, and, as she sat there, a poor priest approached her, begging for hospitality. She rose and gave him water to wash his feet, as well as food of the best the cottage contained, but while she did so, her eyes were fixed upon the forest, looking eagerly for her absent lord. She seemed, indeed, to be lost in anxious contemplation, but was suddenly aroused from her reverie in a terrifying manner, for her guest assumed the form of the monster Ravana, with his ten heads and twenty arms, and in a moment Sita was being carried rapidly through the air in the golden car of the king of the giants. As the chariot sped onward, the poor princess raised loud cries of distress, which were heard only by the vulture king who came at once to the rescue. There was a fierce fight, ending in the infliction of a mortal wound upon the noble bird, which fell to the ground, and Ravana went on his way over mountains, rivers, lakes, and seas, until he came at last to Lanka, his royal city, where Sita was safely housed. Meanwhile, Rama had returned to his cottage with Lakshmana, and so great was his grief at the loss of his wife, that his brother found it necessary to remind him of the necessity for preserving his dignity. This reminder had the effect of calming Rama, who now began to think out a plan for the recovery of Sita. At first he roamed aimlessly about in the neighbourhood of his cottage, hoping to find the lost one quite near to his home, and trying to persuade himself that she had only wandered away for a short distance on her own accord. But he came upon the dying vulture and learnt the truth from him, and now he knew that he had before him a task which would test all his powers to the uttermost. The loss of his wife, however, had only served to rouse him to superhuman efforts, and after the first spasms of bitter grief had spent themselves, he felt able to cope with the strongest powers of evil in order to win his loved one back again, and he found in time a strange ally in working out his task. As he was making his way through the woods, he came upon the monkey king, whose name was Sugriva, and who had a very melancholy disposition indeed. He took no pleasure in the blossoming trees or the song of birds. Flowers to him were mere frivolity, and he only loved the streams because they seemed to him to sing a song which never varied in its mournfulness, and because they were convenient receptacles for the floods of tears which he shed day after day. 
His immediate attendants were Nala, Nila, Tara, and Hanuman, son of the wind. When these intelligent animals saw Rama and his brother and noted the bows in their hands, they took to flight, hid themselves in a dark grove, and seated themselves in a circle with their chins upon their knees to consider what was next to be done. We have made a mistake to run away, said the son of the wind, for these mortals may be of use to us. Men are treacherous and malicious, said Sugriva, dropping a few tears, and we cannot be sure that these two warriors have not been sent here by Bali, the usurping king of the monkeys, to whom all my woes are due. Then the son of wind begged for permission to approach the strangers, and having obtained it, donned a hermit's cloak and went to meet the brothers. Who are you, heroes, whose limbs are like young fir trees? he asked courteously. If your errand be as worthy as your bearing is gallant, let me be your guide through this wood. Lakshmana smiled to see a monkey in the dress of a hermit, and made himself and his brother known to the son of the wind, telling him that a hermit had recommended them to seek the help of Sugriva, the king of the monkeys, in the search for Sita. Hanuman cast aside his cloak. Sugriva is my sovereign, he said. Mount upon my back, and I will bring you to him with the speed of the wind, whose son am I. The heroes at once took advantage of this intelligence, and in a few moments were shaking hands with Sugriva, who was greatly pleased with the sad countenance of Rama, and shed streams of sympathetic tears when he heard of his woes. I saw your beloved carried off, he said, clasped closely in the arms of Ravana. Here he shed more tears, as if he reveled in the anguish which such a remembrance would bring to the heart of Rama. Then he went on. She screamed to me, but was too far off to be heard. But as she was borne still higher into the air, a tiny golden circlet dropped from her ankle and fell at my feet, followed by a scarf of pale soft azure. Then I wept so sorely that the river overflowed its banks. I have the scarf and anklet of gold in my cavern, and I will fetch them to you. He did so, and Rama found it difficult to preserve his dignity at the sight of them. And while he was looking steadfastly at them, Sugriva said, I too am in misfortune similar to your own. Let us help each other. Part 6 The hero smiled at the words, but was too courteous to wound the feelings of the intelligent creature, and begged him to explain himself. So the king of monkeys sat down, with his chin on his knees, and told the listening brothers how he was the victim of the cruel plots of the usurper Bali, who had driven him from his monkey throne. And there is none on earth, he concluded, who is able to subdue the usurper. Lakshmana laughed loudly. Why, he said, Rama, king of men, could hold his own in any circumstances and conquer anything. I doubt, said the melancholy Sugriva, whether he could cope with Bali. Why, one day he clove with one single arrow the hearts of three palm trees. That is child's play, said Rama, and at once sent an arrow from his bow, which clove seven trees and then struck into a hard rock in the side of a mountain. O oh, elephant among men, cried Sugriva, surprised out of his melancholy into admiration. Come with me, and in the strength of your presence I will defy Bali and all his monkeys. So the two set out, Sugriva defied Bali, fought with him, was beaten once, but fought again, and finally, with the help of his new friend, brought the usurper to his death. So was Sugriva restored to his kingdom, and was now ready to place his army of monkeys and bears at the disposal of Rama, in order that they might begin in the forest the search for Sita which they were better able to undertake than the cleverest mortals, to whom forest craft is an accomplishment only acquired after much practice. You may remember how the gods had created this great army of monkeys and bears at the birth of Rama, and their purpose was now to be made clear. For the intelligent animals were marshalled under Hanuman, and told that they were to search in all possible places for the lovely Sita, and to return in a month to make their report. Now their vigorous search was of no avail, and as they were under penalty of death at the hands of Sugriva, if they were not successful, the leaders agreed to put an end to their own lives, for their intelligence was only equalled by their melancholy outlook. 
the ancient vulture whose name was sampati overheard them express their determination and his fiery eyes gleamed with fierce pleasure at the thought of the feast before him beyond a doubt he said in a tone which the monkey leaders clearly overheard it is truly pious to put an end to one's life when the purpose of existence has failed this pious speech did not greatly please the monkey generals for it is one thing to express a determination to die and quite another matter to find that someone will be greatly pleased at one's death so the leaders paused for a while to engage in conversation with the hungry vulture and learn from him that not long before ravana had passed that way bearing the lovely sita in his arms which direction did the monster take inquired the generals with great eagerness a hundred miles from here said the ancient vulture is the sea that washes all the southern coast and a hundred miles from the shore is the isle of lanka where ravana dwells thither beyond a doubt he has carried the beautiful sita when he had given these directions the ancient vulture seemed to be renewed in strength and without waiting for the suicide of the monkey generals spread his wings and flew away then the leaders rose up refreshed and vigorous and put their army in motion towards the sea after a long and somewhat painful march they came to the shore and found the moaning of the breakers quiet in keeping with the melancholy of their hearts they rested for the night the next day considered the problem of transport across the moaning waters a matter of sufficient difficulty to test all the intelligence they possessed the generals ranged themselves in a line along the shore lent their head to the right and looked at the sea and then lent their heads to the left and looked at it again afterwards they all looked at each other and none spoke a word for a long time then hanuman the son of wind rose to the occasion like a true leader will you trust this matter to me he cried we will cried the leaders in reply we will echoed the whole army till the earth shook and the mountains shouted back then they wound a garland of scarlet flowers around the neck of their leader and led him to the top of a high mountain that he might leap from thence right across the water to the isle of lanka for this was his daring plan in a moment his mighty bulk was rushing through the air at tremendous speed while his shadow darkened the kingdom of the fishes who were very angry and sent a sea monster with a mouth like a cavern to swallow him up but he darted into the gaping jaws and making himself smaller forced his way through the monster's back in such a hurry that it died in due time the sun of the wind swooped down upon the coast of lanka rested a while to take breath and then felt so pleased with himself that he actually laughed 